Today I want to share with you a master recipe for making a medicinal herbal syrup using any herb. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Today I'm continuing my series of videos where I share with you master recipes for making medicinal herbal remedies. And if you want to view the other videos in this series, I'll be sure to link to it in the iCards and in the description below. And so far we've covered master recipes for making medicinal herbal teas, medicinal herbal tinctures, as well as medicinal herbal oils and salves. And speaking of the description underneath this video, if you open that up, there will also be timestamps there. And those timestamps will list everything that I'm going to cover in this video. So if any time you want to jump around or jump ahead, it'll be very easy for you with those timestamps. And also in the description underneath this video, there will be a link to the blog post over on my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, that will correspond with this video. And I'll have a lot of information in there all about master recipes and specifically the one we're going to make today for herbal syrups. Also in that blog post will be the recipe, the master recipe for making this medicinal herbal syrup. And you can read that online or you can print it out. Now before we get started, I want to say I'm not a doctor, I'm a homemaker, but I'm a big fan of home remedies. However, if you're pregnant or nursing or you're thinking of using herbal remedies with children, or maybe you take medication either over the counter or prescription, or even very importantly, if you have allergies of any kind, especially those related to hay fever. When you use herbal remedies, you will really want to discuss this with your medical practitioner to find out if this is something that can be integrated or a complement to whatever your situation is at the time. So I always say when it comes to working with medicinal herbs, always err on the side of caution. It's best to be safe. Now two things that I want to cover. First of all, I want to answer the question, what is a master recipe? What do I mean when I use that term? A master recipe for anything really is simply a basic set of instructions with basic amounts that lay out how to make something. So when you look at a master recipe, you will find amounts for certain ingredients. However, there is a lot of flexibility in those ingredients so that in the case of like an herbal uh, master recipe, you can plug in the herbs that you want to use to treat your particular situation or condition. So in the case of making an herbal syrup, a master recipe will call for X number of herbs, X number of water, and X number of sweetener. Now what I like to do is make this very simple for you. And rather than talking in ounces, because I don't think our ancestors were weighing a lot of things and you know I'm the last person who's going to tell you you need to buy a scale to do anything. I really like the idea of just having general amounts and, and always reinforcing with you that this is not an exact science. So don't get wrapped up when you read a recipe and it says ounces. So what I'm going to tell you for making a medicinal herbal syrup is how to measure your herbs in cups to get one ounce and how certain herbs will measure a little differently than other herbs and I'm going to make it all very simple for you. But before we move on to that, the next thing that I want to talk about is what exactly do I mean when I use the term medicinal herbs? Are they different than just herbs? The truth is most herbs, whether they're culinary or medicinal, really fit both roles. And the same is true of spices. These are things that we may use in culinary purposes like thyme and oregano and basil, but all of these herbs also have medicinal purposes to them. So they're wonderful for bringing health properties into our cooking and they're also wonderful for bringing health properties into our home remedies. 
Now today, for demonstrating our master recipe for making a medicinal herbal syrup, we're going to make a thyme syrup. And that's thyme, the herb, T-H-Y-M-E. Now when it comes to making a medicinal herbal syrup, your dried herbs are going to work the best. And if you're using an herb like thyme that's very small once it's all dried up, you're probably going to need about a cup. Now, if you're using an herb that's more like a dried flower, like chamomile, then you're probably going to need about a cup and a half because that's a little larger and it takes up a little more room in the cup. But to get about one ounce, you're going to probably want about a cup and a half of the chamomile flowers. But don't worry, just do the best that you can. It's not an exact science. Whether you have a cup or two cups, it's all gonna work out in the end and it's going to be a wonderful medicinal herbal syrup. Now some herbs are better for making medicinal syrups than others. Thyme is an excellent herb for making a medicinal herbal syrup because it's very soothing for a sore throat and for a cough. So it's a wonderful syrup to have on hand, especially if you're plagued with colds or flus or any sort of upper respiratory infection. It's loaded with all sorts of antimicrobial properties. On the other hand, certain herbs, like for example, rosemary, don't necessarily lend themselves for making a 100% rosemary medicinal herb syrup because rosemary is extremely strong and in large quantities it can take on a rather odd, what some people will describe as a soapy flavor. So when you're using an herb that's extremely strong, like a rosemary, it's best to create a or a medicinal herbal syrup where you're using a combination of herbs where those that are really strong don't take center stage but more take a role of being complementary for their medicinal purposes but yet their flavor is tamped down by using other herbs in combination with them. And I will go into more detail about all of this and about the different combinations that I like when making a medicinal herbal syrup in that blog post that I mentioned earlier. Now today, for demonstration purposes, we're going to keep this very simple and we're going to simply make this a thyme herbal syrup. However, there are a lot of other things that you can add to this if you decide you want to add additional herbal properties or additional healing properties. And something that I will recommend is that if you decide you want, or you're going to go with just the one cup of dried thyme leaves, but you want to add some additional uh, healing properties, you can add other herbs, you can add other spices, and you can also add other aromatics. A wonderful medicinal herbal syrup made with thyme as the base can also include some sliced onions and sliced ginger, and then they're all simmered together, and then you have really an excellent syrup that is wonderful to be taking during cold and flu season. So know that there are a lot of things you can do and I'll cover all of this in the accompanying blog post. And now you know why I tell you that I put timestamps in the description below because I like to be very thorough whenever I discuss medicinal herbs. So it does take me a little while before I actually get to making the master recipe. Now there are a few things I want to mention and I think this will be especially helpful for the beginner. If you find yourself in the middle of cold and flu season and you're new to home remedies and you've not had a chance to make any of those that require a little more time and attention like fire cider and tinctures and so on and so forth, don't worry. Herbal syrups are perfect because these can be made in a day and ready literally within no time at all. And also, if you're new to using herbal remedies, an herbal syrup is very pleasant to take. So if you're not accustomed to taking something strong like a fire cider or something like a tincture, a syrup can be a wonderful, gentle introduction to herbal remedies. Now I do want to take one minute to speak to those of you who have corresponded with me who are diabetics. Now, a herbal syrup is probably not the best option for you. And the reason is, Herbal syrups don't lend themselves very well 
to using um, alternative sweeteners. Now, we're going to talk about some different sweeteners here that we can use, but that are what I would call a real sweetener, like a honey or sugar or sucanat, which is simply the dried sugar cane juice in its whole form, or maple sugar or maple syrup and so on and so forth. We'll discuss those a little in detail later. But again, these are all things that diabetics may not be allowed to have in their diet. You would want to talk to your doctor about that in detail. So if that's the case, if your situation, uh, if you are a diabetic and your situation doesn't allow you to use sweeteners like real sweeteners like honey, then you really want to look to using things like tinctures and your fire cider and your herbal teas, things that are very gentle and that don't have any added sugars. And again, you know, spe specifically in the situation of diabetes, since that's very serious, uh, discuss these things with your medical practitioner. Now for a master recipe to make a medicinal herbal syrup, you're going to need one ounce of your dried herbs. In this case, one ounce of thyme is one cup. And I'm specifically using lemon thyme. I like lemon thyme very much, and this is something I grow in my garden and that I've just dried and keep handy in my pantry uh, for both culinary purposes and medicinal purposes. But any thyme will do. And as I mentioned earlier in the blog post, I'll definitely talk about other herbs that make excellent syrups. And as a matter of fact, if you're interested in learning how to make your own elderberry syrup, which is always very popular during cold, cold and flu season to help boost immunity, I have a video where I show you how to do that. And I'll be sure to link to that in the iCards and in, in the description below. And as a matter of fact, in the description below, I'll put a link to a playlist I have where I've combined all of the videos that I've made for you that include immune boosting foods as well as home remedies. And I think you'll find that playlist very helpful whether you're a beginner or you're far along on your home remedy journey. So we've got our one ounce of dried herbs in this case, uh, one cup of dried thyme. You're also going to need four to six cups of water. Now, I like to use four cups of water because I've been using home remedies for many, many years. I was raised on home remedies. So I'm very used to the taste of these things and I'm very used to the taste of different types of herbs. So I like to make this uh, more concentrated. If you are new to home remedies, if you're new to using herbal remedies and you're new to the tastes of these different herbs that you may use to make these syrups, you may want to increase the water to a total of six cups. Now we are going to be simmering this and we're going to decrease the water by half, whether we start with four cups or six cups, we're going to decrease it by half. Now when you look at other recipes, for making medicinal herbal syrups, you may find that the proportion or the ratio of liquid to sweetener is one to one and sometimes even one to two. I find that exceptionally sweet, but a lot is going to depend on your taste buds and what you become accustomed to in terms of the more medicinal flavors of the herbs that you're using to make your syrup. Now we're going to be decreasing this liquid as we simmer it by half. So as since I'm starting with four cups, I'm going to have two cups of liquid. If you start with six cups, you're going to have three cups of liquid. Now many recipes may say if you have two cups of liquid, add two cups of sweetener. Or if you have three cups of liquid, add three cups of sweetener. And some will even, as I said, do a one to two ratio. So if you have two cups of liquid, they may say anywhere from three or even four, which would be the one to two, four cups of sweetener. And that's just, I feel way too much. So in this master recipe, I'm going to recommend that if you decrease, if you start with four cups and you decrease your liquid to two cups, I would recommend one cup of sweetener, but in the written directions, I'll also explain that you can certainly add two cups of sweetener or even more. And I'll also have the measurements for if you decrease this to three cups, if because you started with six cups. 
Alrighty, now let's take a minute to talk about the sweetener. I like to use honey. It's my favorite option for making medicinal herbal syrups. And as I've shared with you in the past, uh, my husband's cousin raises bees and shares some of the honey with us. And it's always wonderful honey. So that is always my first choice. However, you do have options. If you are new to this and you need to make this right away, and all you have on hand is white sugar, you can use sugar. Because again, you're taking these syrups in relatively small amounts. So it's not the end of the world if you make this with white sugar, if that's all you have on hand, and you really want to take advantage of the medicinal properties that the herbs can offer, and you want to take them in a syrup form. Now, other options are sucanat. This is simply sugar. Uh, it's what white sugar came from. This is a white cane sugar. This is the whole cane sugar, the whole cane, the whole sugar cane juice that's simply be, been dried. So you've got all the minerals intact. So this is one option. Another option is coconut sugar. This works very similar uh, to sucanat, both in consistency and taste. So this is another option that you could use if you uh, are relatively far along on your journey from leaving processed foods like white, white sugar behind and moving to more of a traditional foods kitchen and you've started incorporating some of these uh, various whole sweeteners or whole sugars in your kitchen. Uh, these are two that uh, act very similar uh, in their properties. So both of these can work very well. Another option is maple sugar, although maple sugar I find very costly and I really like to reserve this for those times when I'm baking with something that I want to maintain the light color of, like a sugar cookie. And maple sugar uh, doesn't really have a strong maple flavor, but it's very light in color, so it doesn't affect the significance of the or the coloring of the baked good. So that's what I usually reserve that for, uh, like a yellow cake mix or, a, as I said, sugar cookies. And it is pricey, so I, I kind of use it a little judiciously. Uh, but if you want, you can use maple syrup. This is usually a little more affordable. I find this at Costco and Sam's and uh, usually can get a pretty good buy on it. And that works very well uh, if you don't want to use honey. Uh, you can also use things like date sugar and or date syrup. That's a kind of become a popular uh, sweetener in traditional foods kitchen. But you want to keep in mind that that does have a little stronger flavor and a much darker color. Not that it really matters when you're making herbal syrups uh, because they do tend to uh, lean to a, a darker color or darker um, and, and, you know, thicker and darker consistency. However, uh, depending on uh, your taste buds and those of your family's taste buds, uh, date syrup may be something that you'll want to work up to because it does have a stronger flavor and something that you become more accustomed to over time. But any of these will work very well. And sucanat and coconut sugar are relatively affordable. Now what I'm going to do is pour my water into my pot here. And before we get started with this, I just want to mention, because I get a lot of questions about this little cooktop that I put on my island here. This is made by Cuisinart, and I'm very happy with it. It's just a Cuisinart countertop burner. And I will be sure to put information about this in a link if I can find one. I'll put the model number. Uh, and if I can find a link, I'll put this in the description below. Uh, I'm very happy with this countertop burner. Uh, the only thing that I have shared with many of you who have asked me about it is it does run a little hot, so you just need to be a little, you know, in comparison at least to my cooktop. Uh, so I do need to be a little careful uh, about what one, it's got minimum and then one through five. And I don't think I ever go up to five because this really does run hot. But I'm very happy with it and it comes in very handy. And I also get a lot of questions about this. I, you know, I've had this for so long and I don't even really remember where I bought this. But if uh, I will look online and if I can find one that's very similar, I'll definitely put a link in the description below. Now that I've got my water in my saucepan, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the heat and I'm going to bring this up to a boil. And then we're going to go ahead and add in our herbs, and then we're going to turn it down to a low simmer. 
right when I go ahead and add in the herbs, because that's going to adjust the volume, I'm going to take the handle of my wooden spoon and we're going to go ahead and put it into the saucepan and then we're going to measure how much volume there's in there. And then I'll show you what we're going to do as a little trick uh, so we know when we've reached half, when it has evaporated down, when it's simmered and evaporated down uh, to half. So I'm going to turn this up and we're going to watch for this to come up to a boil. Well, this came up to a boil. I just turned the heat down a little. As I said, this burner runs very fast. So I've got it now on a nice simmer and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add in the thyme. So I went ahead and poured that thyme in and I have to tell you, if you decide to use thyme or in the, in specifically like I did use lemon thyme, oh my gosh, the aroma, it's just amazing. But you're just going to mix this up to make sure all the thyme or whatever herb you're using becomes uh, wet with and submerged well into the liquid. Now I'm going to take the handle of my wooden spoon. I'm going to submerge it down into the pot, into my saucepan here, and I'm just going to gently pull it out. And then you're going to be able to see a water line on uh, the wooden spoon, or maybe a chopstick is also very good to use for this. And then I know exactly what my four cups with the time, what the volume is by measuring it with the handle of my wooden spoon. So now what I do is, now if you want to be very exact, you can do this with a ruler, but what I'll do is simply eyeball this to where I feel is in the middle, basically half. And then when I feel this starts to look like it's reduced to about half, I will use this to check. And all I do in terms of making uh, a little uh, measurement here, some people will use a rubber band. I always feel, you know, is the rubber band food safe? I'm just not sure. But in any event, here's my watermark. I'll take my rubber, I'm take my rubber band. I'll take my little bit of twine here and I'll just estimate, guesstimate uh, where I think the halfway mark is. That looks pretty good. And now I know that I need my liquid to come up to this uh, string line and I'll know then I've reduced it by half. Now you just want to keep this on a low simmer and if I was doing this on my stovetop, uh, I would put the lid on like this, just sort of a jar, and then I would put my exhaust fan on so that it could uh, take down some of the steam. But since I'm just doing this here on the island on this little cooktop, I'm still going to put things ajar and we'll just let the scheme, the scheme, <laughs> we'll let the steam escape where it may. But we're going to keep an eye on that and uh, check it periodically to see when we've got it reduced by half and then we'll move on to the next step. Before we continue with the process of making our medicinal herb syrup, I wanted to share some books with you that I think are very helpful if medicinal herb remedies are of interest to you. And specifically, uh, one of my favorite all-time books uh, that I want to share with you is Rosemary Gladstar's Medicinal Herbs, A Beginner's Guide. And what is so great about this book, it's just sort of an oversized paperback, but it's got a lot of wonderful pictures in it. Uh, but this is, she teaches you how to know the herbs, how to grow the herbs, and then how to use them. And she goes through about, I believe it's maybe about 20, you know, basic or 20, uh, 24 uh, effective herbs to know, grow, and use. And it, the very, uh, Many of them are very basic herbs that you'll be familiar with, like chamomile and lavender and lemon balm and peppermint. And so it truly is a beginner's guide. And everything in this book is so easy to understand, so easy to follow, so easy to implement, uh, so easy to make, you know, when she shows you how to make her different home remedies. And anything but anything by Rosemary Gladstar 
it, when it comes to herbs is going to be outstanding. But this beginner's guide is a book that I highly recommend. And I know many of you have shared with me, you have this book also, and, and you feel the same way. Uh, but Rosemary has a, has a variety of books. This is another one I have from hers that I actually found at uh, Half Price Books. You know, I, I love uh, going to used bookstores. And this is called Rosemary Gladstar's Herbal Recipes for Vibrant Health. And this is another nice book. Uh, she just has a lovely presentation and she's always got good pictures, uh, you know, that help you understand uh, about the herb and what it looks like and, what, you know, what you're going to be doing with it. And so I highly recommend this too, you know, as you maybe go farther down your journey and are interested in, in making even more uh, different herbal recipes. But Rosemary Gladstar's Herbal Recipes for Vibrant Health, and I'll definitely link to these books uh, in the description below if it's something that interests you. But definitely, you know, Rosemary Gladstar is a very pr prolific writer and her books are very popular. So I highly recommend looking in your local used bookstores. And I think used bookstores seem to be becoming more and more popular. Uh, so definitely keep an eye out uh, if you go uh, to their health section or sometimes they're in the gardening section. It kind of really depends uh, where they put them. But keep an eye open for her books because they are wonderful. And then this one is called Fire Cider. And those of you who make homemade Fire Cider are going to really enjoy this. And if Fire Cider is something that's new to you, uh, I'll be sure to link to my video in the, in the iCards or in the description below on how to make fire cider, uh, but or at least the way I make it. And what's so fun about this book, this has 101 zesty recipes for health boosting remedies made with apple cider vinegar. And it's by Rosemary Gladstar, but it's cute because it says and friends, because what she's basically done here is pulled together 101 recipes from different people who show how they make their fire cider, because there's so many different things that you can add to the apple cider vinegar, because that's what it is. It's basically an infusion of different uh, herbs and spices and aromatics and so on and so forth that you infuse into apple cider vinegar and then you strain it after a certain period uh, that you allow it to infuse and then you take it as uh, some people can drink it straight. I usually like to mix mine in a little water <laughs> to make it a little more mild, uh, but it's wonderful for boosting immunity. And so if, if you really find that you enjoy making fire cider and you're really looking for a lot of different varieties, I highly recommend this book. It's a lot of fun. The final book that I want to mention to you is if you find having a resource for master recipes interesting, and I really like them and that's why I wanted to, to share this series with you, uh, I think you might really find this book interesting. It's, it's titled Master Recipes from the Herbal Apothecary. And there are 375 uh, tincture salves, teas, capsules, oils, and washes for whole body health and, and wellness. And this is a very interesting book. What I wanted to do uh, in my series here on YouTube was to share with you those master recipes that I felt were for making uh, the most common things like your tinctures and in this case your syrups, uh, your herbal oils, your herbal salves. Uh, these things I find and, and of course herbal teas and speaking of herbal teas if you uh, are looking uh, for a recipe for making an herbal tea that can really help with a good night's sleep if you struggle with that. Uh, I have a video where I show you how to make that that particular, I have the main master recipe video, but then I have another one where I make the good night sleep tea, as I call it. And I'll be sure to link to that. That's a very popular video, and a lot of people have told me they really like that tea. And I'll be sure to link to that because sleep problems can often be very troublesome. But in any event, getting back to master recipes. So I just wanted to share for you those those sort of broad master recipes that I thought really covered a number of areas that could be very helpful uh, for you to have in your repertoire to be able to make these things that then can become part of your uh, home remedy uh, medicine cabinet, so to speak. Uh, but this book, Master Recipes from the Herbal Apothecary, 
oh my gosh, they go into a lot of detail about a lot of ways to make a lot of different herbal uh, preparations. So if that's something uh, that interests you, be sure to check out that book. Alrighty, well we've got this all beautifully simmered. And what I did was I took my, my, my wooden spoon with my string and when I felt it looked like it was pretty much reduced by about half, you know, I kind of eyeball it and I checked it. I checked it at one point, it hadn't quite uh, reduced by half, but as you can see, this has gotten right up to where the string is. So I know that I have reduced this concoction <laughs> perfectly so that we're down to maybe approximately uh, two cups or so already from the original four cups that we started with. Now what I'm going to do is strain this through a strainer, but we're going to do a double strain because we want to make sure that we get out every last little bit of the herbs. And so the first thing I'm going to do is take my mesh strainer. I'm just going to put it over my measuring cup here. If you have a bowl, whatever you have, and then we're just going to go ahead and start to strain this out. Now, once you get all of your herbs down into your mesh strainer, just press on it ever so gently, just to try and get out any liquid that may be being held in by those herbs. And then when you lift all of this out, let me turn this around for you, and you look down at your measurement, you should have about two cups of liquid if you started with the four cups and you decreased it by half. If you started with the six cups, then you'll have about three cups of liquid. Now don't throw these out. If you compost, certainly you can throw them into your compost pile, uh, but they do. It's amazing how even after simmering in this hot water, uh, they still have some fragrance to them. So what I recommend doing is a couple of different things. Uh, you can spread this out on a baking sheet and just put it in a very slow oven, you know, the lowest that your oven setting will go, or even if you have a dehydrator, you could use that and just let them dry out. And then you can put them in a tea bowl and use them to make tea. Uh, you can put them into sachets uh, to make like a little potpourri, something like that. Uh, but there's still life, in, in my humble opinion, there's still life left to those herbs. So that's a, a few things to think about. Alrighty, now let's move on to the next step. Now my mesh strainer did a very good job straining out uh, the bulk of my time. And when I look on the bottom, the very bottom of my uh, picture here, I really don't see much time. I see a very, very tiny, tiny little bit. So I'm not going to do a double strain. And the reason is because when you do a double strain, you do lose a little bit of that liquid. And I want to try to preserve this best that I can. But if I felt there was a lot of debris that had gotten through my mesh strainer and the tighter your mesh strainer, the better. Uh, but if a lot of debris had gotten through my mesh strainer, what I would do is transfer my herbs to another type of container. And then I would take one of my flower sack towels. If you've been with me for a while and you've seen me make bone broth, you know I love straining using these flower sack towels. And I would just line my strainer uh, with my flower sack towel and then I would put my strainer over another bowl or pitcher, whatever I have. And then I would pour this through to give it a, a double strain and get out any additional herbs that might be floating around in there. But the truth is it's so minor that I'm not going to worry about it because the mesh strainer, I mean the uh, flower sack towel, use to line your mesh strainer, or if you don't have this, you can use cheesecloth. You could also use a couple of coffee filters. All of that would work. The bottom line is they do absorb some of the liquid, but in some cases you have to do that because you really may find that there is a lot of debris after the first mesh straining, depending on how fine your herbs are. So that is something to keep in mind, but we're going to forego that this time. But either way, whether you do a single strain or a double strain, whatever the case may be, 
once you get your liquid to where you're happy with, now you're going to move on to the next step. And the next step does have some variation depending on what type of sweetener you use. There's one way to do things if you use a liquid sweetener, and then there's another way to do things if you use a granulated sweetener. So if you're using a sucanat, or you're using a coconut sugar, or a maple sugar, or a date sugar, whatever the case may be, you're going to want to take your saucepan, you're going to wash it out, make sure it's nice and clean and there's no debris left in there, and then you're going to take your syrup, or it's not your syrup yet, you're going to take your infused liquid, you're going to put it back into your saucepan, and then you're going to take the amount of granulated sweetener that you want to use and you're going to put this on a very low setting and you're just going to stir it until your granulated sweetener dissolves. Now my personal opinion is for two cups of liquid to use more, no more than one cup of granulated sweetener. Uh, but as I have said, you may see some recipes that do call for one to one if you want to do that. Two cups of liquid would call for two cups of granulated sweetener. So that's exactly what you would do. Into your saucepan with your liquid, your sweetener, on low, and just stir it until that granulated sweetener dissolves. If on the other hand you're using a liquid sweetener, like a honey or a maple syrup or a date syrup, whatever the case may be, the process is very easy. You're going to measure out how much liquid sweetener you want. Since I have two cups of liquid, I'm only going to use one cup of liquid sweetener. And so I'm going to use my honey and I'm going to measure out one cup and then I'm just going to add it right into my liquid which is still nice and warm but that's the key. It's just warm and the honey will dissolve or the maple syrup, whatever liquid sweetener you're, you're using will just simply dissolve but we will protect, especially in the case of honey and especially in a raw honey, we will protect the vital nutrients that are in raw honey without putting them back on the heat and cooking them. So let me go ahead and measure my one cup of honey and then we'll go ahead and pour this into our liquid and then I'll show you the best way to decant this. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in my one cup of honey to my two cups of infused liquid. And when you do this, you really want to have a nice pourable honey. That's going to work the best for this process and it's going to dissolve the quickest in the warm liquid. Then I'm just going to stir this around until I feel that the honey has completely dissolved in the warm liquid. Well, I think this is perfect. The honey is completely dissolved. And speaking of honey, I just want to mention, I think most of you know this, uh, but you never want to give honey to infants. You never want to give honey to anyone who's one year old or younger. And if you do decide to introduce honey into your child's diet, uh, or you know, you're using any kind of herbal remedy with a toddler, uh, really touch base with your pediatrician. I know many of you have said, oh, my pediatrician doesn't know anything about herbs or whatever. But maybe you're uh, working with one who is becoming more knowledgeable about integrative medicine. I've definitely seen that. Uh, quite a change from when my son, he's a grown man now in his 20s, but quite a difference from uh, uh, when uh, I first uh, started taking him to a pediatrician and, and some that I've met over the years who are, are actually very interested in integrative medicine. I think, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Andrew Weil, you know, uh, has, in creating his, uh, the study for integrative medicine, I'm not exactly sure what it's called, but I believe it's through the University of Arizona Medical School, and a lot of medical schools now offer programs in integrative medicine. Uh, so I think doctors are becoming a little bit more and more, you know, open to not only hearing about these things, but learning about them, them themselves and then helping us. Uh, but in any event, so I just wanted to uh, mention that. But now you're going to want to decant this. And I highly recommend that once you decant it, you refrigerate it. I know if you, if people say, oh, if you make it with white sugar, uh, white sugar is such a preservative, you know, you don't have to refrigerate it. But I just feel better when it comes to these things uh, to refrigerate it. And in terms of shelf life, uh, again, 
when you're making things homemade and they're home remedies, there's a lot of maybe unpredictability as to say what is the perfect or exact shelf life. But generally, I like to think that these syrups definitely will last you through cold and flu season. And generally, I think stay fresh and relatively potent for about one year. And now what about dosing? Again, you know, home remedies, there's a lot of leeway here on what's considered appropriate. Uh, but if I was taking this particular syrup, most likely I would be taking it because I had a cough or I had uh, some uh, bronchial system, uh, uh, symptoms related to cold and flu uh, in addition to a cough. And I would probably take this maybe three times a day, maybe a teaspoon three times a day and see if it gave me the relief that I needed. Now, personally, I think if you have a choice between a clear bottle and an amber bottle, and I know many of you, when you see me do these types of videos, you say, oh, Mary, where do you buy your bottles? I really don't buy bottles. I kind of just recycle them. Uh, and if you've seen my video about hunting for uh, treasures in the trash, uh, kitchen treasures in the trash, I'll definitely link to that. And uh, it might give you some ideas about where I find my bottles. Uh, but sometimes they're just ones that I, uh, other things were in and I just wash them up and sanitize them and just set them aside for when I need them for my own home remedies. I'm a, a big fan of always letting family and friends know that before they throw something out that to think about it and look at it and say, gee, would Mary consider this a treasure? <laughs> And then uh, depending on what the ordinances are in your town, there always is the possibility of uh, uh, going around on trash day and seeing what others are throwing out. But be careful about that because every town has different ordinances and you don't want to get arrested going through someone's trash but, um, or just their recycling bin. But you can also put your friends and, and neighbors on alert as to the type of things that you like to recycle. But if you have a choice between a clear glass bottle and an amber bottle, I really like to store home remedies of this nature, tinctures and syrups in amber bottles. Uh, I feel that it just helps protect the integrity and the potency of the herbs for as long as possible. Now, if you have a second refrigerator that maybe you don't open very much and you just put this kind of on the bottom shelf in the back, uh, if it's in a clear bottle, uh, that, you know, I think that works fairly well. And uh, if all you have are clear bottles, don't worry about it too much. Just kind of maybe tuck it away in the back of your refrigerator best you can. So each time you open your refrigerator, it does not get too much exposure. You can always take your um, clear plastic, uh, not plastic, but clear glass bottles. And that's one thing I want to mention because I do get questions. Can you use plastic? Glass is always going to be my first choice, uh, but if you do have food safe plastic and that's all you have, then yes, uh, that is an option. Uh, but you really need to be careful and you need to make sure that it is very food safe and that it's not a particularly soft or porous plastic uh, because every herb has different properties and you don't want something, especially in the case of like making a fire cider that we talked about earlier, that would have... Um, you know, the acidic base that may eat away at the plastic. So if you can get some type of glass bottle, all the better. And what you can always do is if you have those sort of little brown sandwich bags, you can put your glass bottle into a brown sandwich bag, uh, your clear glass bottle, uh, which can protect it from the light and the constant light exposure from opening and closing the refrigerator. So that's just a little tip. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start decanting some of this in the clear bottle so you can see what it looks like. It's a little more difficult to see in the amber bottle. Now, uh, I've just got the cap over here on the side and I'm using, if you have a real steady hand and you have a little pitcher like this, maybe you can do it without the funnel, but I find it's a little easier to do with a funnel. Oh my gosh, look at that wonderful syrup. And now this, once you refrigerate this, it is going to thicken up. And if you started with four cups and reduced it down to two and then added the cup of your sweetener, you are going to wind up in the end with about three cups uh, of syrup. And so as you see, I've got 
plenty and and this amount makes plenty for a uh, cold and flu season even for a larger family and then boom you just pop this in your fridge and you're all ready next time you need a medicinal herbal serum. Well, if you have enjoyed learning about how to make this, I hope that you'll click on this video over here where I have the playlist of all my master recipes for making herbal remedies. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country Kitchen. Love and God bless.